Over a billion people around the world live in poverty. Human beings created in the image of God. As Christians, we're called to help, but sometimes our help can make things worse. We wanted to learn more, so we hit the road. We traveled to crowded cities and rural villages. We visited churches and orphanages and businesses and met people from all walks of life to listen and to learn. We asked, what has worked? What has failed and why? What's new and effective? And what are the forgotten truths in need of rediscovery? We asked, what are the foundations that allow human beings, families, and communities to thrive? One of the first people that I helped start a small business in Rwanda was named Florian. And Florian started a gardening business and ended up giving him the tools and capital that he needed to get this business up and running. And after working with him for several months, I went to his home and I recognized that his home had not changed at all from when I first helped him get a job. There was no impact on his family, no impact on his kids. His kids still weren't in school. There were no improvements. And it turns out that he was spending his increased profit on other women and on alcohol. And I remember feeling incredible letdown that I had this promise of, of microfinance and all of my enthusiasm that it was going to change lives. And yet I saw an individual that had a thriving business and yet his life and his family's life had not changed at all. And I remember at that moment recognizing there's got to be more than just in a change in a wallet for significant change to happen. And I think that is where certainly the church and the faith community has something materially different to offer than just another loan, just another job. When you have the opportunity to touch hearts, to touch meaning, to touch purpose, to touch identity alongside helping an individual get out of physical poverty, that's where you see incredible transformation. When you see hearts that are changed and you see wallets that are changed, you really can see communities transformed. In exploring ways to encourage human flourishing in the developing world, we've talked about private property rights, rule of law, and access to networks of productivity and exchange. These are essential, but they're only part of the equation. We can't forget the importance of the gospel. The gospel saves souls and prepares people for eternal life with God but it also transforms the here and now. This change is especially evident when we see the Christian message of hope and freedom replace a fatalistic vision of life. Many people believe that um, you are born poor or you are born rich. It's predestination. They don't see themselves um, to move and graduate from poverty. They get so discouraged. Whether it was Muslims or Christians or Hindus, the poor have been socialized to believe that this was destined for their lives. And when they can understand that, no, that's not what God intended, and that's why he sent his son, so you could have fullness of life now, that's when they're really empowered. In the lower caste in India, I've seen people come to Christ, become disciples, become productive workers, establish education, first an orphanage, then a school, you know, secondary school, and then a university, and then a graduate school, all in the space of three decades. And to be able to create the prosperity and the resources to support all of that out of sheer poverty. And you would have said at the beginning of this 30-year process, this can't happen. But their conversion brought them into a whole life discipleship 
that translated them eventually out of poverty, it's transformative. And the surrounding non-Christian culture can see that. And I think it actually bears up a great testimony to the fact that Christ transforms not just the inner person, but the outer lifestyle. What's amazing is that by faith, a child anywhere in the world will read the scripture, will understand that God has a plan and a purpose for their life. And they'll believe it and they'll move forward in that. It's, it's all faith. I mean, the kid in Manila, Mexico City, kids living in poverty and slums in the US, in Latin America, in Africa, Asia. They get the scripture and it's by faith that they believe what's being said there about God and about who they are as people, as human persons, and they'll go out and do it. It's what you see happening all over the world where you, where you see people coming out of poverty and changing their lives. It's because they believe that it can happen in their own life. We are made in the image of God to be creators. And this belief and this imperative and this vocation has made people who descend from Jews or Christians particularly energetic in creating and exploring and discovering. They had the idea that God created the world and he created it good. He saw that it was good. And so I think they felt the imperative of be not afraid. We don't understand what's going to happen, but let's risk it. And uh, yeah, I think there was a bravery inherent in the Jewish and Christian ideas that have led to one discovery after another in, in, in New Frontier after New Frontier. I recently read a report of a study done by Chinese scholars trying to say, what is it that made the, the West jump forward? Uh, a thousand years ago, China was ahead of the West in invention and discovery with gunpowder and other things. Why did the West jump further and further ahead? And they said, we've studied everything, your military power, your engineers, your mathematicians, your, you know, er everything, your scientists, but we think the one thing that's distinctive is your religion, because this penetrates through the whole population, the people at the very bottom. And it makes out of people who live at the very bottom, often the people who lead in the future. They have confidence in themselves. And they have a vocation. And, and they, they, they feel the obligation to lunge forward. For those with a talent for business, Christianity can transform the way they approach their work. As a Christian, I believe that I do my part, God will do his part. I have to work hard, pray to my God, have faith in him, that he will bless me. And that is what is carrying me on. Otherwise, I have to get out of this business. It's so difficult that without God, you need to get out of the business. You wake up sometimes, you have so much debt you have to pay. You have so many things you have to attend to. You have to attend to workers, you have to attend to go out there and get some more fruit, you have to attend to customers. You look at all these things and it's so difficult you want to stay at home. But you pray to God and there's the feeling that says, go on, son, go on, I'll bless you. That makes me go on. For Christians concerned with fighting poverty, sometimes we can get sidetracked into focusing too much on the physical. Now the physical is important, but if we overemphasize it, we can run into problems. What the gospel calls us to is an integrated, holistic picture of what abundance in Christ really means. And it has to do with material stuff. It has to do with food. It has to do with clean water. It has to do with the things, the stuff of life that we need to live. But that isn't the whole of life. And that isn't the whole of what God calls us to be about providing for others. What's the long-term solution to the problem is helping people everywhere to acknowledge and realize and, and find their creative potential. What Africa needs is not aid. Africa needs love. Needs someone to understand I'm a human being. Needs someone to believe in them. You can do it. Not just like eat this and go to sleep. And then when I need you, I will come and tell you sleep or stand up. We are Christians and I think that it is our job to at each other and look at the poor person from anywhere in the world and be able to say, am I treating this person like I would have loved to be treated? Am I really looking at this person and treat them as though it was Christ standing there? Every simple person 
the one, the homeless standing there who doesn't know where he is, there is a soul there. There is God who have made them, is, is an act of God. Immaculate is proof of the gospel's power to transform even the most horrible situation. Two decades ago, Rwanda was one of the most desperate countries in the world. A civil war had been brewing for years and fully half of the country's population was malnourished. A US aid study from 1993 listed Rwanda as the poorest country on the planet. Then things went from bad to worse. In April of 1994, some members of the Hutu majority began going house to house slaughtering the Tutsi minority. In the weeks that followed, almost a million civilians were murdered while a battle for power raged between government soldiers and a rebel army. Thousands of Rwandans left the country to live in abject poverty in refugee camps. The situation seemed hopeless. Seventeen years later, Rwanda is transforming itself. Peace has replaced war, and there are great strides towards reconciliation. Immaculate has played a crucial role in the healing process by telling her own story of tragedy, suffering, hatred, and forgiveness. A story that begins in a hiding place in the midst of the genocide. My dad sent me to this man who was a Protestant pastor, a neighbor who was from the other tribe, the Hutu tribe. He came and took me and showed me this tiny bathroom in his bedroom with eight people sitting on the top of each other. One time they came to hunt for us, the killers hired by the government, fed by the government and drinks. And one guy stood outside. I can hear him. He went to school with me, primary school. And he spoke and he said, I have killed 399 cockroaches. That's how he called us. And he said, I want Immaculate to be the 400. That would be a good number. And it wasn't just again like, you know, they're coming once, if they go, that's it. But they were coming many times. And I remember when they mentioned about killing my brother and talking how they, he, was a, he had a master's degree, how they have to break his head to see how the brain of somebody who has a master's degree looks like. I was so angry that I spent all my time plotting in my mind. I was thinking about becoming a military, just like shoot them. Every movie, few movies I have seen in my life, or this action movie, you just feel like you're playing them. It was bad, like in my mind I was so angry. My skin was just burning, like you are on fire. So angry and so fearful at the same time. In hiding, Immaculate tried to find peace by praying the Lord's Prayer. But she kept hitting up against one particular verse. And I remember when I was saying our oh, Lord's Prayer, and I remember reaching to that part that said, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And all of a sudden, it was almost like a picture of all the killers was in front of me, thousands, if not millions. I remember one time I said, okay, let me face it. I'm incapable of forgiving. I don't even think it makes sense. I went on my knees, I put my hands up, surrendering, and I told God, if you know how to forgive, help me out. I don't know how to do it. Only because I wanted to go through those prayers. So at least I can be clean in God's eyes. Until one day, meditating on the death of Christ when he was dying on the cross. And I remember the last moment when he said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. And when he said those words, especially that part that said, they don't know what they do. It was then I said, okay, now I can understand. I can understand the mind that is blinded by hatred, the mind that is blinded by selfishness, the mind that is blinded by power, love of power, love of money. And it was almost like Jesus was telling me, pray for them to change instead of hating them. Are you going to be like them? Are you going to do what you hate most, which is the genocide, the hatred? Are you going to do that? Or are you going to try to change them? 
So then I started to pray for them. It made all the sense. Immaculate survived the genocide, but before it was over, the genocideers found and killed her mother, her father, and two of her brothers. Despite this, she set out to spread God's message of forgiveness and reconciliation. Many others are involved in this crucial work, including Janet Ukabana, who grew up in a Ugandan refugee camp before returning to her native Rwanda after the genocide. A decade later, Janet and her sister began a basket weaving company and soon realized the need for Hutu and Tutsi to reconcile and learn to work together. And so they decided to use their business to help bring this about. People were still healing from the wounds of genocide. Others were still possessed by trauma. So now bringing them together was another question for me. You have both sides of the genocide. We have the women who have husbands in prison. You have widows. You have girls heading households. Looking at a woman whose husband is in prison but who has killed her family, bringing them together was another challenge. So I had to get to talk to each one of them. And I was telling them, when you come to this place to meet me, I don't want to hear the stories because I also have a story. I want us to focus on what we are doing. I started now merging groups of survivors and uh, other groups, and now the tension now started reducing. At one particular moment, one weaver came up and said, my husband killed your family. And I really feel so about that. You've been my friend since we started, this, we stayed in this village. I want to say sorry on behalf of my family. And actually she forgave them. It was featured on CNN. It was an event in Rwanda and they celebrated the reconciliation. Rwandan Anglican Bishop John Rutiana has also been deeply involved in the process of reconciliation. He's partnered with Chuck Colson's Prison Fellowship to minister to those imprisoned for participating in the genocide. Through their work, many of the genocideers have found their way to Christ and have reconciled with the families of their victims. Bishop John also started an orphanage in the aftermath of the genocide and welcomed Hutu and Tutsi. He emphasizes that what is impossible with man is possible with God. Recently, I was preaching in Saddleback with, the, with Rick Warren's church. I was telling the people at Saddleback that we have no luxury of time to wait until the pain is over in order to reconstruct our nation. It's now. If there is any time, it's now. When we still bury the remains of our people, when we still cry and miss those we, we love and cared for, it's now that we have to build our nation. And, and our efforts are real. Come and visit my school, Sunrise. Most of the students are orphans, and, and some of them still bear the scars of the machetes on them. Some of them have seen their parents hacked to death, but they, they are all Hutus and Tutsis working and studying together, eating together, staying in the same dormitories, and they have a common hope for this nation. And they love each other today, and they have a common purpose of developing into servant leaders of the nation and, and upholding and serving their nation. And, and this recovery, therefore, is a commitment into the future and, and, and the transformational power into, into the brokenness of a nation. And I, I want the world to know God invests into the broken once we surrender. And this type of surrender, and this type of not wanting to revenge and, 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 and killing people in jails because they killed a million people, but engage, invest into, the, into their repentance and the transformation and recover them back into society to join us into the reconstruction. That's the miracle and that's the power. One of the most interesting articles that I read was Matthew Paris's article, an atheist take on why Africa needs God. And what he said was there is a difference when he saw the faith community involved in poverty alleviation 
and he saw a difference from the programs that were just going in and just trying to help people but had no ability to talk about a moral foundation. And so they were doing all this great work but without a moral foundation and he saw that that really crippled the impact of the goods and services that they were providing. And so his article says that there is a difference, that Africa does need God if it's going to work its way out of poverty. And, and it's true, without that moral foundation, I've seen this in, in the places that I've traveled to, that the impact is always going to be limited. But I guess I find it a little bit surprising that Matthew would say that Africa needs God and the United States doesn't or, or Europe doesn't. I think that foundation, that need for a moral base is the true foundation for every single country. And, and Europe and the US, we've benefited from having that moral base and we turn away from that moral base to our own decline. Good Christians can and do disagree about the best ways of helping the poor. But whatever we do, we must never forget the gospel, both because it's at the center of our faith, but also because it's the most transformative force that the world has ever seen. As C.S. Lewis once said, those Christians who've done the most for this world have focused a lot on the next. The apostles, the early Christians, the men who built the Middle Ages, and Christians like William Wilberforce, who abolished the slave trade. All of them left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. Lewis concluded, it's because Christians have ceased to think about the other world that we've become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither.